Hey Z Stars, happy month of March and welcome back to my channel, Epic Zara. It's your girl Zara, aka Epic Zara, and I'm back with another video for all of you. If you've never been here before, thank you so much for joining us. If you've been here before, hey, what's good in the hood? You all know the drill. Let's get right into this video. But before we do, you guys be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I've realized that I don't really plug those places much and I'm trying to get back into posting very frequently. But while I'm not on YouTube, you guys can always reach out to me via Instagram. Instagram and Twitter. Today, your girl wants to bust some serious myths about natural hair. Now, I've been able to move beyond these many falsehoods to grow a lot of hair. I'm going to highlight exactly what they are so that we can get our lives because this year is fine girl by force or fine guy. But anyway. <laughs> I'd like to remind you all to do the four simple things I always remind you to do before we begin this video. Be sure to comment down below, let me know what you think these myths are going to be and be sure to add myths to your own. Be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, it lets YouTube and me know that you all enjoy this type of content. Be sure to share this video with all of your friends and your loved ones. And last but never least, be sure to subscribe to my channel and turn your notifications on. That's super important you all if you want to see me, see my face or whatever so that you know when I post a new video so I can talk to you and you can talk to me. <laughs> okay, that's everything. Let's get right into the video. I completely disagree with this. However, I'm in full support of the use of strong cleansers, cleansers that lather, shampoos, soaps, etc. But why do I avoid sulfates? I'm gonna let you know right now. Those sulfates are not proven carcinogens. They are linked to several other issues. What exactly are sulfates, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. They are surfactants. Now I'm going to actually consult my resource to give you all a well-rounded definition of what a sulfate is. <clears throat> Surfactants are compounds that lower the surface tension or interfacial tension between two liquids, between a gas and a liquid, or between a liquid and a solid. Surfactants may act as detergents, wetting agents, emulsifiers, foaming agents, and dispersants. Now I know you guys are still probably asking me, Girl, did that even tell us what that meant? What did that mean? It basically means that they make it easier for active ingredients in your shampoos to properly clean your scalp and your hair. In smaller concentrations, they are not necessarily harmful, but frequent and continued use of surfactants can actually really strip the hair and the scalp of sebum and also cause protein loss in the long run, which is not cute because your hair is made of keratin and we want that keratin to remain intact so that the hair retains its integrity. Sulfates are also known to cause adverse reactions in subjects with sensitive skin. As a result, though they may not necessarily be the root cause of hair loss, they can certainly exacerbate it, y'all. Sodium lauryl sulfate is actually skin permeable. This means that it can be absorbed into your skin, y'all. This causes irritation, dryness, and other ailments over time, and frequent exposure can increase the levels beneath the epidermis, which is pretty problematic, y'all. Now, as much as I love a good lather, your girl avoids sulfates. I typically use a Castile soap. My favorite ones are by Dr. Bronner's, and I lean toward the Baby Mild, the Peppermint, and the Tea Tree, which I will have linked down below in my Amazon store. I have a list for all my favorite products you'll see that there. I might also make a specific list for this particular video, but I digress, y'all. <laughs> anyway, I make sure to use Castile soap to cleanse my hair, my scalp, or a black soap. Now, these cleansers are actually very strong and extremely clarifying, so they pretty much are a nice reset. Now, for someone like me who has a sensitive scalp and sensitive hair, these healing soaps are really fantastic because they take care of my scalp and they ensure that all the debris is very well removed so I can have a clean and healthy hair and scalp environment and see my hair continue to grow down my back because my follicles are not being obstructed by debris. So while I'm telling y'all to stay away from those sulfates, I'm still letting you know that you need to be cleansing your scalp with the soap, y'all. <laughs> like... I'm actually not going to go into that too much because I reference it in another video, which I will link right here, my unpopular opinions video. So y'all can check that out and get all the tea so that you can grow some really long hair. But um, yeah, granted your water should not be that hot because most proteins begin to denature around 105 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to put the Celsius equivalent up on the screen for you all because your girl's not gonna metric, but um, <laughs> 
the hot showers are around 104 to 106. So make sure that your water is toasty, but not too toasty, y'all. Now, I'm a fan of a hot shower, but I also want to maintain the integrity of the keratin that makes up my beautiful hair. So digression aside, if you are not low porosity, if you are not protein sensitive, if you are not coconut oil sensitive, then you should probably be rinsing your hair with cool water. Now, <laughs> there are certain processes that require the cuticle to be open, such as dyeing the hair. So if you're trying to color your hair, then you're probably going to rinse with warm water. However, if your products have a low pH, your cuticles are finna close anyway. Now, I'm not a cosmetologist, y'all. I just like to do my research and a cosmetologist would certainly know much better than I do when it comes to situations where it's a bit helpful when the cuticle is not laying as flat as it could. But the bottom line overall is this. Rinsing with cool to cold water is not for everyone, boo-boo. Now I've talked about this in a few videos and I'll probably put them in the card. But y'all, that doesn't even make any kind of sense. Like, no, your hair grows from the root. The ends are not in communication with the root. Hair is made up of compounds that are not alive. The follicle is the only thing that's living in this equation. So cutting your hair is not gonna affect how your hair is growing out of your scalp. Trimming your ends can aid in length retention by preventing your hair from continuing to split up the hair shaft. However, it cannot directly make your hair grow long. It's a transitive process because by keeping your ends healthy, your hair is able to maintain what it has gained. Now you all, if your ends are healthy, you probably don't need to trim very often, but I do like to dust my hair. Really often, I probably should chill out, especially since I would like to make some more gains, but it's good to keep an eye on your ends, especially if you're focused on the health over the length. Now, what is a healthy end, you may ask? A healthy end is an end that is free from excessive splitting, knotting, or fraying. Cutting your hair is definitely not going to make your hair grow, but it's going to keep your hair healthy enough to retain length. First of all, which exploitative, light-skinned, loose-textured, Instagram baddie, natural hair babe said this one because that reeks of loose, curly texture privilege and I'm not here for it, y'all. There are so many different textures and we cannot all be doing wash and goes every second of every day. Like, no, fam, no. If you are type four, this is a lie from the pits of hell. Doing wash and goes exclusively, especially on type four hair, leads to single strand knots. You can't retain as much length as you would otherwise, which leads to stunted hair growth as a result of the botched length retention. The best styles for length retention are styles that stretch the hair. Now, I'm a protective style babe over a loose hair babe, and nine times out of 10, you're going to see me in a protective style. When my hair is loose and not in a fro, it's usually in a stretch style, like a bun, or I'm really just wearing a big twist. I can't come and kill myself. I'm trying to grow my hair. And wash and goes are not the way forward. Don't be deceived. They're cute every once in a while, but you can't be doing them 24-7. This is another one of those lies from the pits of hell. Like, y'all, who's coming up with this stuff? I understand why people utter it because chances are your hair will be a bit thicker than your relaxed and or damaged hair. But genetics are the determining factor when it comes to how thick and or how dense your hair is gonna be, y'all. Now your hormone and nutrient levels play a huge role as well, but we're gonna get into that later. You may or may not be wondering why I separated density and thickness. That's because they are two separate concepts. Density is the measure of how much hair is on your head. Is it 5,000 hair strands or 10,000 hair strands? And I know those numbers are wildly off, but this is for illustrative purposes, y'all. Now, thickness is the measure of the circumference of your hair strand, or rather how big around your hair strand is because most African hair types exhibit flatter hair strands. But anyway, that's another story for another day. For example, my hair is super dense. There is a ridiculous amount of hair on my head and you can barely see my scalp. The strands are a bit on the fine side. I'm gonna see if I can make them thicker. If you guys want a video, want a journey on that, let me know. But we're gonna see if we could do that from the inside out and also with some external aid. Oft times people say that my hair is really, really thick, but that's because there's so much of it on my head. There are some people that exhibit hair strands that are close to the size of a thread. Now again, all these things are predetermined by your genetic makeup, but if you'd like to try and increase your density and thickness, you can start working on your nutrient levels and you can also work to take control of your hormones. Vitamin C, omega-3, iron, and other nutrients are nutrients that feed the hair exceptionally well. The consumption of these nutrients will ensure that you push your hair's density and thickness to your genetic ceiling. This is a much lengthier process, but those who are nourishing their bodies internally will definitely see the results externally through their hair, skin, and nails. 
You can also do henna. This is a mechanical way to increase the thickness of each strand. Now, I do this on my hair and I've seen huge gains because it's made my fine strands much stronger and fortified them against the environment. Now, I have a video all about how I do my henna <laughs> and I'm going to link that right here for you all. You can click on it and watch it right after this video. Other ways to do this are green tea rinses and rice water rinses. Green tea in particular targets density more because it reduces the amount of shedding. Rice water also reduces the amount of shedding and in addition, nourishes the scalp and aids in hair growth. Now I've been contemplating doing a rice water journey for some time now. Let me know what you all think. If you want to see me do all of that, your girl is here for y'all and I'd like to see how much my hair can grow. So anyway, I digress again as usual. You guys let me know in the comments down below. <laughs> Now this myth is actually extremely important to understand because the two are separate entities. Now you can have dry scalp when you have dandruff, but dandruff in itself is not dry scalp. I'm going to actually provide some textbook definitions for y'all because this really needs to die. Now dry scalp is the result of too little moisture. This causes the skin on your scalp to become irritated and flake up. Now if your scalp is dry, it's not impossible and it's highly likely that other parts of your body are dry as well. Dry scalp can also be triggered by factors like these. Cold dry air, contact dermatitis caused by a reaction to products you apply to your scalp, and older age. The skin cells on your scalp and body normally multiply when you need more of them. Then they die and shed off. When you have dandruff, skin cells on your scalp shed more quickly than usual. The main cause of dandruff is seborrheic dermatitis, a condition that turns the skin oily, red, and scaly. The white or yellow scales flake off creating dandruff. You can get seborrheic dermatitis anywhere you have oil glands, including your eyebrows, groin, armpits, and along the sides of your nose. In babies, it's called cradle cap. Often, a fungus called malassezia triggers dandruff. This fungus normally lives on your scalp, yet some people have too much of it and it causes skin cells to multiply more quickly than usual. Certain factors can cause malassezia to multiply, including age, hormones, stress, and etc. Dirty hair doesn't cause dandruff, but if you don't wash your hair often enough, the oily buildup can contribute to flakes. One way to tell the difference between dry scalp and flakes from dandruff is by their appearance. Dandruff flakes are bigger and they look oily. In babies with cradle cap, the scalp looks scaly or crusty. Both dryness and dandruff can make your scalp itch. So there you have it. Dandruff and dry scalp are indeed different, though you can have both. My sister, my brother. Hair is made up of non-living compounds. It is not going to get used to products, y'all. There are a lot of naturals that perpetuate this myth, but it's never going to get used to products. Contrary to popular belief, nor will your skin. Your skin may grow to accommodate certain irritants, but healthy ingredients will continue to work on the hair and the skin. What you should focus on is switching up products to accommodate a season and not any imagined change in effectiveness. Most changes in how effective a product is are directly linked to seasonal changes because seasons are a huge determining factor when it comes to the type of care and nourishment that our hair needs. So, girl or guy, do not be hasty. Keep your product in your arsenal and use what has always worked for you. So everyone, those are the natural hair myths that I find super irritating. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know down below which ones I forgot, share the ones you've heard, and bust those bad boys. This community that we have is absolutely beautiful and I'd love for us to continue to educate one another on our type four hair so that we can grow our hair to Rapunzel length or whatever. <laughs> so again, thank you all for watching. Please don't forget to give it to a big thumbs up. Be sure to share this video with all of your loved ones. Be sure to comment down below and let me know what myths deserve busting. And last but never, ever, ever, ever least, be sure to subscribe to my channel and turn those notifications on so you know every time I post a new video. Thank you so much for watching. I love you so much and I'll see you in the next video.